Uh, so I wanted to start with a story. I heard that was a good uh, talk technique, so I'm going to try it. Uh, so here's a guy. He's at his desk. He says, I'll write a simple jQuery app, uh, because app is cooler to say than application. Um, and so he starts with some HTML. It's HTML9, I guess. Forget about that. Um, so this, this is the future. Um, and uh, that's just a joke. HTML is unversioned. Uh, it will never get to 9. Um, sorry to disappoint you all. Uh, so he adds in jQuery. And so now we have a jQuery app. It's in the page. It doesn't do anything uh, except for make your page way better. Uh, but it's just parsing and executing, and then nothing happens, right? And he says, fresh. I'll, do, I'll get some plugins to uh, do some more stuff with. And so he adds in uh, AJS, uh, which is, uh, I think that's just spelled wrong. It's the Canadian uh, plugin. Um, <laughs> he adds in Select2, which is a sweet plugin, and then Cycle, um, because that's, uh, everybody needs that on their page. And then he, he cracks his knuckles, and he goes in and says, uh, uh, it's time to build my actual app. And you can tell this is a contrived example because he hasn't like checked Reddit or anything yet. Um, <laughs> so he adds in uh, his files. Uh, he adds in uh, the core of his app, and then he adds in his utility functions because he doesn't know about underscore yet. And then, uh, and then he writes kind of the app part, and then he has that like oh crap file uh, that everything gets uh, put into later called uh, funks and vars. Uh, <laughs> I wish that was a joke. <laughs> So uh, he command shift R's, and uh, he waits for his page to load. He waits for his page to load. Gives you the look. So this is what uh, we're set out to solve. Um, but more importantly, we're set out to solve uh, mind performance. Uh, and so the, the two halves of this talk, um, uh, well, not, they're not separated by time. The, the two things I want you to learn from the talk are how to make your, your deploys faster and your pages faster, but also how to make you uh, a more performant programmer. Um, so I want to optimize for the way we think um, instead of optimizing for the way we've always done things. And so a bunch of script tags on the page is, is a hard thing to keep in your head, uh, especially whenever those script tags are dynamically injected uh, all over the place. I, I know some of you have some Drupal install where you like write in script tags into somewhere and then like turn off script injection and then like the, all the marketing people can put in their ad tags. Uh, and I'm sorry that you have to do that. Uh, there's a support group later. Uh, manual dependency management uh, is not fun. Um, you forget to take out the things that you don't need anymore and you inevitably get it wrong whenever you have to generate that order. Um, and we're just not that good as humans at remembering our dependencies in our head for the two or three years that our application lives before we redesign it uh, with more gradients, or less gradients now, less uh, flat design, some flat, uh, Apple flat design joke there. Um, so a 10,000 line of code application is not something that um, a ton of people uh, get the joy uh, of doing, but a lot of people will tell me like, oh man, I got to work on this application, it's really complex, um, and it's just one file, and it's 10,000 lines of code. And that's kind of like the people that are like, man, I write all my websites in Notepad, because that makes me cooler. Um, and it's like more, to, it's closer to the metal. Um, and that's not something that I necessarily agree with. Uh, I think you should use the tools available to you to uh, optimize your, your mind performance. Um, you should have a snippet to, to put out the HTML9 doc type for you instead of memorizing it and, and putting it out yourself every time. But you should also memorize it uh, just because it's really easy. That's kind of the whole point. Anyways, uh, so you don't want to sacrifice um, any type of performance uh, just to build apps the good old way because you've always done it that way. Uh, so I say, uh, the script tag is dead, except for one. You can have one. Um, so it's almost as, it's nearly dead. Uh, there's a Monty Python joke somewhere. I'll get it next time. Uh, so long live modules. So uh, Alex talked about modules. I'm not talking third person. Alex McPherson before me talked about uh, the idea of modules um, 
before me, and, and I'll, I'll go into that. But before I do, I want to say I am the creator of Yepnope, uh, and many people know that uh, either as modernizer.load or, or something. I just say, don't ever use it. Um, there is like a very narrow use case for it, and that was my intent. And then it actually got really popular because it's fun to say. Um, but you should probably be using an actual dependency management solution. Uh, Yepnope just like, instead of writing script tags willy-nilly, you get to write JavaScript willy-nilly. And so it's pretty much the same problems. Um, so most non-trivial applications, and, and that's where Yepnope could come in. Like if you're writing a splash page, you could use it, sure. Uh, but, but you're going to want to uh, internally modularize. So a lot of people think about modules and they say, well, I'm pulling in these libraries as modules, and then my app is a module. Um, and that's probably not good enough. Um, jQuery is in this state right now. It's uh, you know, kind of jQuery.js, uh, and we're finally kind of breaking it out into Ajax as a module and uh, the DOM part as a module. Uh, and you, that's why you can build those off now on the jQuery website. And in the future, jQuery is even moving more towards modular design. So like the extend function or like the internal method that generates a UUID that we stick on the, uh, the prop uh, in order to do um, expandos, that's a module that you could use. And that'd be the only thing you, you pulled in. And so internal modularization allows you uh, a lot of flexibility, a lot of code reuse. Um, and I think you should write your applications in that way. AMD stands for Asynchronous Module Definition. Uh, so a lot of people will tell you that they use AMD modules. Um, and it's kind of like the, the ATM thing where you're saying machine twice, ATM machine. Uh, but it's fine. A AMD modules uh, are what I prefer. Uh, there are other styles of modules. I prefer AMD um, because uh, you can run them out of a folder. You don't have to have some uh, web server running Node in order to translate your modules into something that the browser can understand. Uh, the browser speaks AMD because it's just regular JavaScript. Um, a lot of people hate the boilerplate of AMD most, uh, but I find it fine. Um, this is it. This is an AMD module. Uh, it's not super hard, uh, and uh, I'll go through it for you. So there's a global define function. There's also a global require function. Uh, Require.js is the most popular library to do this, and most of my examples will, will fall into that. But it's a standard, so there are other uh, AMD loaders, such as Cujo or the Dojo uh, loader, and there's several others. Um, and so the define is a global and require is a global. And naturally, something called require.js, normally you use define, uh, obviously, very obviously. So you have uh, define as a global variable, and that's OK. And then uh, you have a name that you give your module. And so this one's called child. And then it has two dependencies. Um, and that is your mom and your dad, because it's a child. It's a very good example. I actually wrote a blog post making fun of people who use uh, parental inheritance. Um, and now I'm realizing that I'm that person. Um, and then you have a return uh, value. So this function is what runs asynchronously. Uh, so this function gets the mom and the dad dependencies as objects um, into this part of the function. And that won't run until those dependencies are resolved. And so whenever you ran that code, uh, it would say, I'm named child. Go ahead and load the mom and the dad. And when those are done, pass them to me and then run me. Uh, and because of that, you can set up these huge dependency chains and say, I need something. Um, make sure they're there before I run. Um, and that can be extremely helpful in uh, optimizing your mind performance. Uh, so what's it got to do with jQuery? Uh, why is it called depending on jQuery? Because many people don't know that jQuery is defined as an AMD module. It uses a name definition. So this says, define me as jQuery. I depend on nothing, because I'm just one giant big file. And then return the jQuery object. Um, and so this is, uh, it's about 9260, because the source changes a bunch. And I didn't check right before this. I apologize. Um, and uh, so in your code, you can say, this is my application module. Uh, I require jQuery. And we're going to pass it in. When it comes in, we're going to use the dollar sign function, because it's way cooler. And it's, jQuery is way faster when you use dollar sign instead of the actual jQuery name. Uh, it's not true, sorry. Um, and then we can do a document ready, and uh, our alert app is done. Uh, so from the top, how that works is you have an application folder. 
Inside that, you have a JavaScript folder, and you might have one index.html page uh, in this case. Um, you have jQuery in a file, you have your app in a file, and you have require.js in a file. Uh, and so those are the three parts of the JavaScript that we're going to use, and we have the HTML to put it in, and, and that's about as simple as it gets. So in our HTML, uh, we first use our one script tag for require.js. And require.js, one of the ways you can use it, there are, there are many ways to kind of instantiate an application. Um, you can say my main module is js slash my app. And so what that'll do is it, it'll inject js slash my app, it'll run it, and in there it'll say I need jQuery uh, and I am my app. Uh, and so then it will go and load jQuery and once jQuery is done, it'll pass it into this function, it'll run it, and then we get our alert app again once the document's ready. Uh, we can make it anonymous because um, it has a file name. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you'll find that you want to move a module around. And every time you move a file around, uh, you don't have to rename the, the inside of it. And so in order to uh, keep things dry uh, and don't repeat yourself, repeat yourself, you um, just use the file name as the, as, the, as the name of the module. And so when you change the file name, the module is also changed. And so the name of this is just my app because it's at myapp.js. If we change it to myfunapp.js, uh, it would now be called myfunapp.js. And so we're, we're keeping things dry in that way. And that's it. That's, that's AMD. It's just get me these things before I run. And you have a starting point with a single script tag, and then it just handles the rest in your code runs. And so now you can break things up into little files. But you're saying, well, I didn't write something that just needs to alert. And also, you're ridiculous for waiting for document ready. Uh, just to alert something that's not a dependency. Um, so more real world, uh, we have like a simple Backbone application. Uh, not everyone is familiar with Backbone, but uh, Backbone pretty much doesn't do anything uh, except for like uh, define a little bit of a structure for an ap your application. And so it's kind of the easiest to grasp right away. You don't have to know really what anything does. Uh, so we have a we have a folder now called JS, and it's got a model folder and a view folder because we're using MVC. Um, there's no C in, in Backbone. Uh, my friends like to call it uh, MVWTF. Uh, Should have got that joke slide in. I'm really disappointed in myself. Uh, anyways, uh, you have Backbone JS now. You have uh, jQuery. Um, and you have your app again in require.js. Uh, you still have that same index.html file. Uh, same thing that we did before. We say, go ahead and start at my app file. Uh, and then inside that file, uh, I didn't show this before for simplicity, but you can kind of give like the base URL to where your application lives. So you probably don't want to put all your files in the root directory. Uh, and so in this case, we don't want to have to require everything as JS slash model slash person. So we just say, assume everything has JS slash in front of it. Uh, and so our base URL is JS here. Uh, and then our app is, uh, it needs the, the person model, and it needs the, the person view. Um, and you don't really have to have uh, much knowledge of how that works, but more or less, we instantiate a model of view. A view takes the model, and then we render the view. Um, and that's a cool thing. So our application is like immediately uh, just dealing with backbone parts, and we render a view. We, we instantiate a view and a model, and we render them. And we're just dealing with application level stuff. We're not manipulating the DOM directly. Uh, we're not doing anything. We're saying our application is our application. And we can dive into the dependencies uh, a little bit. So we have the, the person model, and that's going to require backbone. And uh, it doesn't really matter what's in there, not, not important for the example, but we're returning some extended model. So our person model is probably going to have you know, a walk or a talk function on it that we could call, um, uh, or uh, I guess it would be more like eat or my name or something is a model. But either way, um, we, we extend that and we return it as this module. So whenever someone requires model person, they get back an extended backbone model. Uh, view is very similar. We're using render in the app, so I went ahead and put something in there. Uh, some of the internals uh, aren't there. In a view, you're dealing with actual DOM stuff, and so we need backbone and we need jQuery because we're going to use jQuery a little bit. Uh, 
One of the functions in our view, among others, is the render function. And all we do is uh, Backbone will give you an element, say, like, I'm attached to some element on the page. Uh, and uh, that's jQuery wrapped. And you'll say, insert the HTML of my template and render my template, and then uh, pass it the data that's in my model. And so the render function uh, gets data, changes it to JSON, sticks it into a template, and then injects the HTML into the element that's connected there. And so you don't necessarily have to care about all that. But the idea is that uh, the, the view does what the view is supposed to do here. It requires Backbone and jQuery uh, totally separately from that main file. Uh, and then uh, we have to realize that Backbone isn't something that's an AMD module. So a lot of people are saying, uh, uh, I want to use AMD, but there are only a handful of things that support AMD, so it doesn't feel like we have enough buy-in in order to go full hog, um, and whole hog, full hog, whatever. Uh, so there is the shim property in your config that you can use. Uh, and we say anytime someone requests to use Backbone, load the Backbone JS file, and then I need the Backbone variable from it, uh, and then it's going to require jQuery. So from the outside, you can kind of say, since Backbone isn't AMD compatible, go ahead and load it, grab the global variable Backbone, and make sure jQuery is loaded before you execute that file. And so you can use third-party libraries that aren't AMD compatible uh, by the shim, via the shim. And, and that's good. And config gets way more exciting. Uh, this is seriously like gets me excited when I think about uh, AMD config. So, uh, so you can have a map, mapping of file names. Um, so a lot of times you'll have like this huge uh, lib source something slash something something slash something something something. So uh, uh, I think. What is, there's a PHP library that's really good at that. Uh, anyways, uh, Z, Z, what's the Zend? Zend is like, OK, anyways. So simple uh, is a good way to map the really long file name to something simple. Uh, and so you just give it an arbitrary name. And every time that you require simple, it actually goes ahead and requires that much longer, harder to type thing. Same with relative. If you need to go below your base directory, uh, it'll go ahead and figure out that you don't want to be in the JS directory and you want to get something else uh, with Unix style uh, uh, you know, uh, path modifications. And so in this case, we pull in those simple and relative things, and they're actually going and grabbing separate URLs. So you're not tied to your folder structure directly, um, but most of the time that's a good thing because you don't have to manage those dependencies elsewhere. It's just good to clean some you know, base directories up sometimes. Uh, you can also map to different files uh, inside of dependencies. You can require separate, um, separate dependencies with the same name. So if Backbone, uh, some plugin in Backbone and some plugin in jQuery each want to require uh, the Foo plugin, and they require different versions of the plugin to work, you can actually say, anytime I'm asking for Foo, give the most up-to-date version. But whenever I'm using this old module that requires this old thing, Go ahead and give it like two versions ago. That way, they can both work. That may not be great for your file size, but if those modules are small, maybe it's maybe it's okay. But it's good to know that you can do it. Uh, it's a, a, another thing that people say they won't use require for is because their dependencies are more complex than they can put into a file structure. And generally, with config plus a file structure, there's nothing you can't do. I haven't run into it uh, yet, at least. So your config plus all your modules means that you can start doing builds. Uh, and builds are the goal here because this isn't uh, scalable. This is uh, like better than, I think, most of the websites on the internet uh, because they're not doing any concatenation. It's not quite grunt, uh, um, but it, I guess it works. Uh, it's very hard to manage. You have to kind of know the order again right in this step. Um, and then you go ahead and run Uglify against it. And that's cool. Uh, instead, we can give it our application directory. We can tell it our base URLs. We can give it the directory we want to put it in. We can tell it to optimize it with Uglify. Uh, and we can tell it which files to generate. We can exclude modules. We can add additional modules. There's all this, this config can get really huge uh, if you know what to do. Um, and then you run the require.js optimizer tool against that config file, and boom, uh, you have a, a folder in, uh, in the build folder, you have uh, files in the build folder uh, with the names that you decided. And, and the only thing you have to do to make your application work is just give it the new 
base URL to the build folder instead of the dev folder. And so flipping between dev mode and build mode is literally just a tiny string change. And that, that can be really nice. This is a recap to kind of that intro. AMD modules describe their own dependencies, which is better than describing them again externally. Uh, you might see, have seen the jQuery UI manifest files. So a lot of their dependencies are reliant on manifests, and that really is hard to keep up to date with the actual source code. Uh, you end up having dependencies that aren't really there or missing dependencies entirely in edge cases. Uh, they have uh, compatibility with non-AMD uh, modules, and it works very well. Globals are the old school modules, um, and you can uh, start using AMD right away with just a big config file uh, without having to update actual code, and that, and that can be really nice. Uh, it also means that you can grab things off of CDNs still and, and use them without modifying that code. They're small and concise, and our app function only did app things, our view, fu our view file only did view things, and our model uh, file only did model things. So it, it lends itself to a good, clean file structure. You know where to go look for things. Builds are free at the end, uh, and that's maybe one of the best things about it. Um, but then we run into some problems now that we're jQuery authors trying to use multiple module systems. So plugins technically are their own module systems. Instead of like adding a key to the require namespace, we're adding a key to the prototype on jQuery. Um, and that's just kind of like the most popular module system there ever was, was the jQuery plugin uh, stuff. So whenever people tell you that Node modules are the most popular, it's actually probably jQuery plugins. And so be glad that we didn't just standardize the most popular uh, module format because you'd have to write jQuery plugins in Node or whatever. I don't know. Um, so your jQuery plugin is, is just going to modify jQuery. It doesn't have a return value. Generally, when you load a plugin, it just modifies jQuery, and then you use jQuery as, as you would. And so that's a little bit weird. And so you can use a shim in order to not modify the file. Uh, so you say, I have some plugin.js. Uh, and it's going to need jQuery. And so I didn't have to modify the plugin. It, uh, Require.js will make sure that jQuery is loaded before it runs. Uh, and then uh, you actually return jQuery from the file. Um, uh, and that can be cool. My actual um, suggestion is that maybe plugins, now that we're uh, past um, some set of application complexity, are no longer the right way to structure an application. And so unless you're taking an array of elements and modifying them slightly, uh, maybe a plugin isn't the best place to put your code, maybe just a regular module that you require like a regular thing that just has jQuery as a dependency. Rather than uh, pulling in jQuery that has a plugin dependency, uh, it's kind of a weird backwards uh, dependency tree from, from a technical standpoint. So you could also do uh, something we haven't talked about, which is uh, AMD plugins. Uh, we have plugins just like everyone does. Plugins are cool. Uh, so we'll write a plugin plugin. Uh, and all that does is make sure that jQuery is loaded for it. Uh, it's that $fn bang part of that. And it just says, like, just so everyone knows, this is a plugin. And since plugins don't return anything, we just don't put anything in the function that, that it comes back. We don't use it. We just assume that it's going to be there. That can be a little confusing. I don't actually think you should do that. I just wanted to. Uh, give you your options. So AMD plugins are a cool topic, though. Uh, I have another story for you. This one's more out there than the last one. So imagine you're a messenger. That's your job. You are, um, you are paid to send and receive messages for, for me specifically. Uh, and I said, go forth and see if Paul Irish has any info for me. I want to know the info from Paul Irish. And you wrote away, and you said, well, I'm not going to ask Paul. I know his fiance's home right now. Uh, so she'll answer the door. And I'll say, Paul says to tell Alex, uh, well, she, she says, uh, Paul says to tell Alex that Paul really hates sandwiches and wants to give him this $5 bill. So that's the info. Uh, and you went, you asked the wrong person straight away, which is like, fine, you're still getting the info. Um, uh, and then she told you that he hates sandwiches and wants to give me $5. And that's cool. And so you wrote back to me, uh, and you told me that Paul loves mayonnaise and that he wants to give you $1. So you just kept four, I guess. Kind of a jerk, guys. 
Um, and that would make you a plugin. Um, <laughs> so bear with me. I gave you a job. I gave you a location to go to. Uh, I asked you for some specific information. And you just kind of did it. Uh, you went to a different source that was related to the original source. And you modified the information before you gave it back to me. So you were kind of like uh, the middleware to me getting info from Paul. I could have. I know where Paul is. I could have just gone straight to him and gotten info, but I sent you, and I kind of know you're the type of person that's going to steal four dollars from me and maybe change the info a little bit. So it's expected behavior, and it's almost like I wanted it to happen. <laughs> so a, a plugin is a mediator between uh, two endpoints, and in the case of AMD, it's the mediator between I want something and what I actually get back isn't always that something. Uh, I don't know what that means. So text is the easiest uh, uh, plugin in AMD. It comes with require.js. Uh, text uh, is whenever you just want a string. And so uh, whenever you want to require just a string of things, maybe uh, your favorite paragraph uh, from your favorite book or something. I don't know. It's ridiculous. Why would you want that? Um, but you want to log out a string. Uh, oh, I guess Paul's diary is what we're logging out. It's much better. Uh, thanks, old me. Um, so we're pulling in text as our dependency, and it's a string. Uh, and so all that's happening here is the text plugin is, is you guys from that example. Uh, it's the messenger. And so there's a text.js file, and it says, what did he ask for? What name did he ask for? And it says, paulsdiary.txt. And he says, all right, instead of loading that as a JavaScript file and trying to execute it, because it'll just have syntax errors, actually, that's not true. Paul's diary is completely valid JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> But in most cases, most people's diary aren't, isn't. Uh, and so it wouldn't work. You can't just like, include paulsdiary.txt as a script tag in your page and like, have that data. You need to do like, an XHR uh, for it, like do, do a jQuery.get for that text. And it will return it to you as a string like you wanted it. And so what the text plugin will do is it'll say, well, I'm not going to just load this as a script like you normally would have. I'm going to go do a jQuery Ajax call for it, grab it at that same name. I won't change the name at all. Um, I, I'll go straight to the source, but I'll load it in a different way. And then I'll go ahead and give it back to you as a string instead of giving it back to you as a function or an object or something like that. And that's all text does. Uh, it, it reads the name you send it, uh, Ajax is that as a string, and then returns that string to you, which is different than the scripts that we talked about. So templates would maybe be the next step. Most templates you write as text. And they're not uh, known to a browser as anything that's parsable or runnable. You're using JavaScript in order to run your templates and inject them. And so a template plugin uh, could be the text plugin. So you pull in handlebars, um, and you use the text plugin. You go grab uh, TMPL as a text file, comes back as a string. You compile it, and then you inject it into your page uh, after you call it. And so there's boilerplate there that says every time that we want to grab a template, we have to do the same thing of turning that string of text into a template. And so we're using maybe too much code. So we can take out the boilerplate and say, let's write our own template plugin. And so all that does on the inside is pretty much the same thing as the text plugin, but right before it passes back to you, it compiles as a template, passes it back to you as an object. And so that's like where instead of taking $4, you're compiling the $5 into a valid JavaScript template. Um, this is simplified. This is not how uh, the actual internals of the template function would look. There, there's boilerplate to require functions. I just wanted to make that known that this wouldn't just work. You can't just put this on the page. Sorry. Um, so the messenger takes the info you gave it and does something slightly different. So uh, still, what does jQuery have to do with any of this? And the trick is that. Uh, jQuery is just as normal as any of your modules. It's a dependency. Uh, you might use it in some files. You might not use it in other files. Um, I think I have an article back in the day where I was like, here's how you build jQuery applications. Um, and I think maybe that's the wrong way uh, of thinking about it. Uh, I want you to modularize your code with modules, uh, not modularizing, too hard of a word, with plugins. So any proper module system will help you uh, attain that. And I'm not necessarily 
saying don't use jQuery, uh, but use plugins for what plugins are for and use modules what modules are for. Uh, Backbone is good for app structure. jQuery is not. It's a, it's a dependency of Backbone even. Uh, Adam gave a talk recently where he quoted me saying that jQuery is a tool. Um, and so I'm quoting him, quoting me that jQuery is a tool. Uh, and I think that's uh, a good thing to remember. It's just a dependency uh, of your application, and it's not the core of the application you're building. Uh, he, his talk is very good. It's, it's 40 minutes of him reiterating that statement. So it's good. Um, so the next time uh, you start an app, instead of downloading jQuery first, uh, download require first. Or, or better yet, download Bower or Yeoman or something like that, and, and just you know, Bower install your dependencies as you need them. Uh, instead of saying, well, I know I'm going to need jQuery ahead of time, uh, pull in as a dependency as needed. Uh, so most of the time, jQuery is pretty good at Ajax and DOM access. Uh, a lot of the other stuff is tacked on um, and necessary for internals, so we expose it. Um, but really, like the core of jQuery is really good Ajax, really good DOM access. Uh, and then you can pull in those as dependencies. Uh, so that is the information that I wanted to convey to you. Uh, we can, I have time for questions. Uh, I don't know if lunch is set up, so if you're really hungry, you should probably leave. But very quietly, questions? Uh, yeah, you're right here. I'll repeat your question, yeah. Callbacks to append modules? When it, whenever it's like finished with something. So, so most libraries aren't going to uh, execute right away, right? So you pull it as a dependency, and then you like run it once you're inside of there. And once you're inside of the actual dependencies, like you can just use a callback like you would in a normal file. Uh, maybe come to me if you have questions. Uh, <laughs> I made a huge, vast error by telling you to leave. Thank you.